So hello everyone and uh, thanks to Phil and the team for organising today's today's session. Uh, I'm the CEO of Solus Group and our aim is to help the industry embrace modelling data visualisation at every stage of engagement, uh, not, not just the shiny bits that maybe sometimes that we're, we're known for, uh, but it's an end-to-end -end process that we're looking to tackle here. So fundamentally, the hardest issue to solve with technology is the variations in human behaviour and how we, how we communicate. Uh, the capabilities of the software, and certainly as we've seen through this, this morning's of the event presentations, um, is that the information it produces is, is incredible. Um, but it's a long way, and it's a long way from the 2D CAD plans that I started with, um, and that once were, were considered complex. Um, so the, the downside of this, much as with life today, is that there's a, an overwhelming volume of, of data associated with that. Um, so yeah. I think this is a, a scene that's replicated in many workplaces, I'm sure, across the, the world, day in and day out. <clears throat> and part of the problem is uh, that you know, professionally trained people don't find it easy and you can understand that you're admitting um, or openly voicing a concern over the interpretation of data is still a big challenge. So that, that's fundamentally at the heart of it. When you scrape away the various things that we can do, then ultimately, yeah, we, we, we allow problems to pervade our projects because these, these problems aren't detected until something is implemented. And the information, as, as, as time goes on, it gets more and more complex. So the more impressive it is, and as we've certainly seen lots of that this morning, it's how do we, how do we aggregate that in a way that, that everybody has good access to it so that's really, really what drives us to work alongside this level of data. Um, so yeah, we, we, we strive to combat this with a, a better scalable engagement process that can run through the entire engagement process. process. And I assume that yeah, engagement is a cycle, it's not a, not a series of one-offs. So in the, what we call the before times, there was understandably a growing momentum around the use of immersive collaborative review processes for large projects, um, where complex stakeholder networks interact you know, with extensive and, and evolving data sets. Uh, but these days, a review meeting increasingly looks like this, <clears throat> and this is a real example of a, a session similar to many that we've conducted through 2020, where we've used pixel streaming, and in this case, a live review of an unreal model of a, a large commercial development to achieve the same aim of bringing investors, developers, agents, and designers together with a consensus-led approach um, to decision-making. Uh, we still use mobile devices to help combat that, um, and again, that's taken a, I've been given a, an added layer of relevance um, in this period, and of certain various augmented reality modules that are a great way to make use um, of the, the kind of power that people have at, at home um, with mobile devices, and there's various functions like the lightweight virtual tours using things like a magic door, immersive 360 views, and their interactive product placement tools, which are again are, are really useful for all sorts of evaluation of, of kind of physical products. And it shows that you can scale between building size, room size, and, and product size. And um, again, further highlighting the flexibility. And um, this is an example that we, we can overlay, you know, a lot of the virtual data that we're showing on physical elements as well. So whether it's bringing kind of site hoarding to life showing buildings where they don't exist, or you know, we've done a few recent examples where we've added information to 3D printed models. Um, so there's, there's various ways to do that, and that the connectivity that I'll touch on later on um, will, help, will help show where we can adapt and, and provide a multi-platform interface for this, this type of engagement. Um, integrating data across the life cycle of a project, as you'll see, is increasingly important. It's been touched on today already, um, and that the key, certainly we believe the key to realising the potential of digital twins and smart buildings is formulating a digital delivery process and um, a set of processes that enable this connectivity via platform agnostic interface. 
Um, and as a prime example of how we can enable this broader stakeholder access, we've, we've developed a site-wide model for the Dubai Expo 2020 legacy site. We are through web-connected CMS systems. Uh, we've provided a range of engagement interfaces. Um, the example there is the, the leasing app for the commercial space on the site. So although on the surface, they may, this might look like just another visual presentation, the efficiency comes in the way these sorts of images are generated and how we can provide that more scalable engagement process. And looking at the images as a as composed representation has a purpose, but for the engagements that really matter in these projects, the aim is to ensure an unequivocal level of understanding that, that can't be misinterpreted. And this is where we make that critical step from presenting um, a series of abstracts that require layers of interpretations, which ultimately you can't control to experiences that are practically impossible to misrepresent. So this is a, a video um, of that, that kind of site being experienced by people at an event where they've, they've never seen that development before. Now, I'm always, always in two minds about this, because a little part of me dies when I see people holding up their phones and not taking in the experience. But the other part of me really enjoys it because they're, they're clearly very convinced that they are there and that's exactly you know, what this is all designed to do. So when I see this happening, it's shown in these photos, uh, you, you don't really want people thinking about the installation. It's, it's not about that. The key is that it enables the emotive power of this shared experience and a level of open and inclusive dialogue that's impossible through anything less than an immersive viewing experience. And on the subject of immersive, you know, it's, it's worth touching on where we are now with VR headsets. Uh, they're certainly unlikely, they're not going to, going to go away, but we, we can't help but predict that their use will be stalled in light of what's happened over the past 12 months. So our expectation is that people will be using them at home more, if anything, and that's probably going to spur the next wave of adoption when it happens, uh, much the way, you know, the adoption of tablets has helped them become a a kind of pervasive platform across our, our industry, but the, yeah, they're unlikely to be used for any large group meetings anytime soon. And this is where the scalability of our approach comes in. Uh, this example was an industrial training simulation for the Thames Tideway project, and the, where the traditional VR version worked extremely well in enabling project team members to rehearse and learn the the operational processes years in advance. So we take the same simulation and scale it up as easily as we would scale it down for use on a mobile device, which we actually did do. And um, there was a, a kind of mobile VR version of this, and we also put it into the reality portal. Um, and this gives us a much more open interface to, group, to support group learning and, and instructor led training. Cool stuff, Scotty. Really enjoying this. Beautiful Good graphic. Stuff. Thanks, Phil. So I have to also talk a lot about levels of immersion because it is a, a term that gets used quite a lot. And depending on where you're, I guess, your entry point and how far you've gone with it, everybody's got a slightly different view of it. So yeah, we, we're constantly trying to push and understand the definitions and references that we use. Um, so yeah, we, we still use and accept that there's a lot of non-immersive technology. I, I, we do talk about it a lot, um, but it's but it's not the be all and end all because of a lot as you, as you've seen, especially while we're working remotely and don't always have access to immersive technology. Then anything on a what we call a traditional screen of kind of small to large size is technically non-immersive, but doesn't mean it's not part of this scalable approach. We then move up a little bit, which is maybe where it, it can get a bit more confused, where you have kind of semi-immersive. Now, that there is a point where, yeah, by kind of marketing brand standards, an IMAX cinema is immersive. Um, but yeah, we, we're looking for something more scientific and more technically correct for, for what we're trying to do as an industry. Um, so yeah, some of these displays have some of the attributes that we would see them being classed as immersive, usually the size of the screen in the sense of scale that it can get across. And you have some that are in the middle, 
where yeah, they, they lack some of the attributes, but if you stand close enough um, or you use it a certain way, you, you'll get some of those attributes coming through. So what's always driven us, because we do develop for, for various systems, but yeah, we can't ignore the fact that yeah, we've, we've, been, we've, we've all um, been kind of looking closely and, and worked with VR for the past eight years in various forums. So we do have a, a better understanding of what true immersion is, and that's really where our, our sites are in terms of, of where we are as an industry. And also because you know that there might be restrictions on headsets and group settings, we don't want to lose the benefits and then roll back 10 years um, to older systems that, that, that don't give us the, the quality or accuracy that we need. So everything that we are, we're about developing is about replicating that effect. So in terms of that scale, all, all of these things have their place and are valid in different circumstances. And that's really the, out of that, the only thing there that is VR is are the VR headsets, because to meet the, the kind of purest definition, then it, it needs everything that you can get in a headset and user control, which you can't get in a shared setting. So our, our goal here is to get as close as possible to that viewing experience uh, without killing that dialogue, because that ability to conduct a dialogue is imperative here. Um, not not the subtle, subtleties of user controlled motion. So they, they are all part of a set here of engagement and yeah, the, the, the engagement rules rather than the installation or the technology sitting behind it. And then although these are, are grades of immersion, they, they're, they're not they're not meeting the basic definition of VR um, in terms of uh, kind of having the standard screen technologies moving all the way up to virtual environments. Um, in, a, in a, a fully immersive system or a headset. So you can pick up the same thing in design. So I'll, I'll move through the rest of it because what we're showing here is that the same principles apply across every stage in a project um, and for every every discipline involved in it. So you can pick this, definitely pick the same thing up easily in design where a lot of this starts. And most designers are accustomed to working with artistic and technical abstract, abstract, but it is overly labor intensive and it's it's hard work to share that with clients and get uh, the right response immediately. So there's, there's definitely a lot, a lot we can do in that area. Uh, this example, you may have seen, we, we posted it about it recently. Um, it was a relatively kind of straightforward kind of environment in a first pass on a design of, of a Microsoft and Microsoft HQ in Dublin. Um, so this, this was developed in Unreal Engine um, using base designs, bringing in Revit models. Um, and what we were able to do is they, they took this over and presented it on headsets you know, where they needed that mobility. But again, we were able to, to, to take the same data and scale it up for this experience that only needs you to be able to walk through a space. Um, this is an example of a, a kind of top architect um, using their own data in it to actually conduct reviews with principals, team members, and bringing clients in. So this is you know, some of the biggest architects in the world um, starting to use this technology because it just makes so much sense. If everybody can understand reality, it's the ultimate aggregator um, of information. And these, these were a series uh, of similar, similarly sized architects that were supported at the World Architecture Festival uh, back when events were a thing in 2019. So visualization has remained fairly steady in architectural design for centuries. Uh, and you know the extent of a lot of visual engagement results in pictures being produced from hand-drawn sketches to emotive photorealistic imagery. Um, but they, they fulfill an important function, but they're, they're rarely enough in their own right. So what we're talking about now is actually changing that process as well. So yeah, I think that the ability to draw and the importance of that, you know, isn't going away anytime soon. But over time, in the way, you know, further generations are being conditioned to kind of work with 3D, and um, you know, they, they play games, they have it in in school now. That 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 way of learning will change. It just needs, I guess, the, the kind of professional, um, academic side of it to catch up. But if if we can design this way, if we can put prototype 
them from the ground up and from the inside out, then what we can do here is take things like SketchUp and Revit and any tools that we want to, to use can be brought front and centre and more people can be involved and more of the right people can be involved in that process. So as a quick example here, uh, this, this is a different view on Revit as an example. So yeah, as, as changes are made, what we can do here is somebody would normally be sitting there and then releasing it. So the alternative to that is, well, let's not, let's, let's iterate the change because we've got the power of, of, of all these parametric software tools, but why not make use of that? Let's iterate, let's try different things that we otherwise um, wouldn't want to do because again, there would be too much risk. And let's get a consensus yet with the designers, with the specialists, bring the clients in, give them the ultimate service as in grain. And then this, if we start this early, that this is the approach that carries all the way through through the project and into operations. Uh, Enterprise with Scott, design. How much more time do you need? Uh, a few minutes. Okay. I'll go quick if you. Um, so yeah, on, on planning, that's intertwined. So we've used this to help achieve planning consents. So we did this on a, a scheme in, in kind of London recently, um, where there were issues with the, the kind of planning authority that, again, it's always hard to communicate using the, the kind of traditional ways of doing it. So they, they had five versions of VR, but it was really just kind of CG-based VR. And um, so what we did is we ran a number of sessions with the developer and architect initially to kind of work out how they get around these problems. And then they, they set up another session at the development director's request where they, they got the planner, the planning team in. Um, and we created a kind of light version of the model that focused on the, the green space, uh, which was the big issue on the, the site. Um, and again, spent a, a good hour and a half going through this. We had the, the first version of a view city integration running with this as well, and it just was really successful. And although we were doing all the other media around that all these images were produced, they were informed by that level of informed dialogue. And a similar process with the, the, the Everton Citywide public consultation in the new stadium at Bramley Moor Dock. So they were able to take the plans for the stadium out to the city and have people literally do the do the journey of how you know they, they were moving ground to the docks, how that was going to be redeveloped, what was happening with Goodison, and actually, you know, this this tease of what the new stadium would be like. And that was that was the same coordinate, coordinated models were used as the basis of the People's Project app. So that was very successful. Taking that onto construction, we have the same issue. So you'll see the, the repetition of the same issues here. So on kind of sites, we have got reality capture um, as, as one key requirement. And um, we can convert that reality capture into models using scanty BIM. And as we've talked about today, you know, we're obviously quite heavily involved in trying to bring a lot of this approach now in, into construction. So with integration that we have with things like Synchro, it's very easy to do mixed reality versions of these models on various platforms. So you've probably seen it running in a HoloLens, and Greg's presented that. We can run it on a, an iPad. We can take it out onto site using an iPad and see the same thing. I'll just go through these quickly. And on a HoloLens, and this was an app that we did for, for Skanska. So actually taking up a practical construction use case and making it, getting rid of the paper-based process um, and individual kind of sheets and able to check kind of pile stats. So it's, it's not meant to be visually overly impressive, but it's very practical and very accurate and a, a great demonstration of how this technology can, can take BIM data out into the field. 